tell his story in less than 20 minutes is, uh, is quite unfair because uh, teachers take that much time to clear their throats. In any case, we must surrender to the formats. Thank you, Ted X, DPS Goodgaon, young friends, Principal Aditi Mishra, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak to young students. I think it's one of the priceless perks of being a teacher. Thank you. I will skip this. I would want you to have a look at this slide. Uh, and what was the take of John Charles Polanyi on the 21st century science and youth? I'm not sure how many of you agree, but I completely agree with what he said. But that's not my quiz. The quiz is now coming your way. Please raise your hands if you believe in what I'm saying. How many of you think that the global poverty has been eradicated? How many of you think that the global environmental pollution has been eradicated? Now that we are on the same page, I can continue. Not that I wanted to convert you. I'm not in the business of proselytization. I'm a practitioner of science and work with facts. Not only facts, but stories behind these facts. These ideas are contained in my book, which is there, out there, Life in the Himalaya. Let me go to the story. The story is, date, is dated to the summer of 1972, 5th to 6th, 16th June to be exact, the place Stockholm, and the event, United Nations Conference on Human Environment. Among many prominent leaders that attended the conference was our own Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Now, I will just pause here and tell you that notably, a person who chaired this United Nations Human Conference on Environment was a person called Morris Strong. He was a Canadian businessman with interests in oil and minerals. I'm afraid not very benevolent for environment. But that's not important. But since then what has happened has that most of the global summits on environment have been deliberating on how to save businesses rather than saving the environment. But in any case, let me go back to the story during her address to the conference, Mrs. Indira Gandhi made a rather very innocuous, some people thought it was an innocent or a genuine remark, and she asked, and I quote, that are not the poverty and the need the greatest polluters? Now this was a, a very genuine kind of an expression, but this, the public response or the, or the global response was, another commission which was created by the United Nations called World Commission on Environment and Development, which was also known later by, by the name Brooklyn Commission because it was headed by the former Norwegian Prime Minister, uh, Gro Harlem Brooklyn. And what had world achieved was that they had fairly and squarely put the blame of environmental, global environmental pollution on the world's poor and the poverty. Therefore, when they submitted the report of World Commission on Environment and Development, which was ultimately published in the form of a book called Our Common Future, which for the first time used sustainable development as the panacea for getting rid of, of, of the evils of pollution on Earth. But more than that, the route that it took was that in order to get rid of environmental pollution, what we need to do is that we need to develop more and more. We need to have more economic development to get rid of poverty first. Because poverty 
and pollution were inextricably linked in this. And the premise on which it was based was an economic principle which is called Kuznets Curves. These were developed by Simon Kuznets, a very famous economist, which in, in simple language said that during the process of industrialization and, and, and economic growth, initially there will be a lot of income equality among people. But over a period of time, then uh, the income inequalities will decline. So applied to the environmental issues, the same principle was that during the initial processes of industrialization and economic development, pollution will grow exponentially, but over a period of time, as the incomes grow, you will have less and less pollution in the long run. But as another famous economist, Keynes, said, in the long run, we're all dead. And that's exactly what, what happened. So did this panacea called sustainable development actually yield the results that it was supposed to? I'm afraid it didn't happen because greenhouse gases did not come down. As you can see here, China's greenhouse gas emission rates are about 12% a year. Imagine. And the global broken promises of the release of $10.3 billion to the developing world, and out of that, a paltry sum of $0.3 billion, which is less than 3%, which is less than 2.92% exactly, that, that's what was approved. And back home in India, if we see how we have fared in the Sustainable Gold Index, we'll see that we are almost laggards at 116 rank globally, with just about 58 global index. So I've just given you three examples how the promises of sustainable development did not. What exactly happened? These are some of the realities. This is, you can see the glaciers, and this is a Tibetan glacier in high Himalaya. You can see 2009 picture and 1921 picture. So climate change is the first repercussion of these greenhouse gases. Well, another bad news came while we were all celebrating Independence Day this year. Tama Carlton published this very damaging kind of, of, a, of, of a paper in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the topmost scientific journals. And what she found was that in the last 30 years, 60,000 farmers in India had committed suicide, which she directly correlated with environmental change, specifically climate change. And uh, she, of course, uh, you know, found the reason that how uh, farmers fell in debt traps because they, during the crop, crop season, they would need more water, and it is high temperatures that time, water is not available, they have to dig deeper, they take more and more debts, and then in my own research, and if you have the book, or you will likely to have the book, a subchapter called a streetcar named Maruti, this is exactly what my research found, that after 1983, there was a spur, huge surge of number of cars being produced in India. So a motor vehicle revolu revolution was heralded by, by Maruti. But what we failed to see is this, the amount of you know, carbon which is getting into the atmosphere exactly coincides with 1980 uh, revolution, or what I call the Maruti uh, revolution. With the result today, even in the high, deep interior Himalaya, you have huge amounts of black carbon, including on the glaciers, in, like I have said, Satopan Glacier here. Now, what does black carbon do is that it settles on the glaciers and the glacier because it can it can absorb solar light and it heats up the glaciers and glacial ablation you know go, goes goes very high we have these are our own from my own research group what we found was that actually himalaya are the hottest 
or the warmest mountains in the world. More warm than any other mountain, because obviously we are in the, in the tropics. Now, two things have happened as a result of this, this, this warming. It has changed lives and livelihoods of, of people in the Himalaya. The first resource is that what we also found was that now these beautiful Himalayan meadows of which you see the, often you see postcards. Now, those are being ingressed by, uh, by shrubs. And a large number of medicinal plants, herbal medicinal plants, come from these alpine meadows. And what it does is it seriously undermines the first resource which people use because this is an alternate uh, healthcare system which people, people have there because they, there is no healthcare delivery system in those regions. So they depend on these, these resources, first resource. And also, this is an example which I have discussed in my book of the yak. Now, with the ingression of these, uh, these shrubs and grasses going, into the, going away from these uh, uh, alpine meadows, what is happening is that the basic life support system of yak, and yak, I'm, I must tell you, is fundamental, is crucial to the life and culture of these Himalayan highlands. But for yak, Himalayan highlands would never have been, uh, they, humans would have never settled there. Yak, both in, his, in its life and death, serves, serves humanity in Himalayan highlands. As you can see, you can have a large number of products while it is alive and dead. Now, if the grasses grow, and if the, if the grasses go extinct, what happens to the yak? If the yak goes, what happens to the Tibetan and high Himalayan highland culture? So we are looking at complete cultural annihilation of a, a very distinct uh, Himalayan, Himalayan culture. So because of all these troubles, a lot of uh, thinkers, writers, scientists have been disenchanted with this idea of sustainable development because this was possibly far away. Those who developed it, possibly Stockholm or Zurich or New York or Washington, they are far away from the last mile. Therefore, what happened was that there was a disconnect between the practitioners and those who had developed it. So uh, people like John Robinson, you know, they say that it, it's, it's vague. It's for hypocrites. It fosters delusions. So he says that it's almost saying that have your cake and eat it too, which, which you know is not possible. One example which I want to give you, because it's a most recent example, the most recent climate summit that happened, this is the Paris Climate Summit. Now, look at this declaration at the end of the day, 52-page document. Mentions carbon six times, economy 29 times, finance 35 times, water zero. And I'm sure none of you believe that water should not have that place at that high table because water is going to be crucial. India and China both can talk about double-digit economic growth, but they are suffering of water deficit, and this is going to be a, what they call it, a, a thorn in the flesh for double-digit economic growth. So what, where do we go from here? So I suggest that instead of sustainable development, we should ask a different question. We should ask not that you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. You should ask a different question. You should ask that how much cake can we bake? So if you do that, then you come to this sustainable living model which premises itself on three important factors, the carrying capacity of air, water, land. If you, and that will be determined by these three issues, geophysical vulnerability, ecological fragility, and of course the cultural sensitivity of the people. What do I mean? Now, for example, can Delhi and Gurgaon afford to have so many vehicles, motor vehicles? 
I simple answer is no, because the baseline of suspended particulate matter in Delhi and its environs, particularly the southern parts, that means including Gurgaon up to Jaipur, is, is very high because we are close to Thar Desert. Therefore, you may have all kinds of technological and administrative interventions in the form of, uh, in, in the form of uh, alternate vehicle numbers or what they call odd even, you are never going to get rid of pollution because the base level of suspended particulate matter in Delhi is very high. I was so inspired in the morning by looking at those children when they came. In fact, if we did this, we'll be doing a great service to Delhi and its environs. So what does this mean? Is sustainable living means that we must now have a bottom-up approach in which we must, we must plan according to the amount of land, water, and air, how much they can sustain, how much population they can sustain. So if you were to, if you were to sort of put it into a simple matrix, you will see that it, it's a simple equation. Either there are too many of us using maybe lesser resources, or we are too, too little of us using too, too many resources. So if you multiply 10 units of population by 5 units, 5 units of consumption, you will get 50 units of impact. Or you multiply 5 units of population by 10 units of consumption, you will still get 50 units. So what do we do? Reduce, reduce population. First thing, both. Reduce population, reduce overconsumption, only then can be this earth as a sustainable living place. We also have, besides that, to, you know, to, to take care of some cultural issues. Uh, okay, so here is an example, which I have said in my book. This is about entire about Southeast Asia. You can see that we often, you know, bemoan that our rivers have run dry, our springs have run dry. Believe you me, none of them have run dry. They still have that much water, if not more. The only thing is, there are too many of us who are drinking their waters, who are using their waters. So, there's a, there's a negative correlation between the demography and, 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 and the resource, resource availability. So that brings me, finally, to the first Gandhi, or the original Gandhi, who said, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greeds. So you will have to ponder, is poverty and need the greatest polluter, or is the, you know, unencumbered pursuit of wealth that equals greed to pollution? So I want to, my idea is to turn Mrs. Gandhi's idea upside down Rather than saying poverty and need lead to pollution, I say wealth and greed need lead to pollution. That's what I believe. You may think otherwise. Thank you.